Our scripture reading today is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the Spirit? Is there any compassion? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others, too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. May God add a blessing to the reading, to the hearing, and to the living of this word. Is there any compassion? This was a rhetorical question on the Apostles Paul part, just so you know. Is there any compassion? Of course there's compassion when you are in Christ. So he assumed. Nonetheless, it calls to mind for me the legend of the ancient Greek philosopher Diogenes. Is anybody familiar with him? I remembered him. Before I remembered his name, I remembered his character from I think it was maybe 10th grade when we read bits and pieces of Dante's Divine Comedy. He's the one, I believe it was, in limbo when Dante was wandering around in limbo. Diogenes was the one who carried around a lamp searching for an honest man. The second reading today is obviously a clip from a TED Talk. Um, it's a video clip that uh, speaks to compassion. It is by the minister, Pentecostal minister, who was at Riverside Church in New York uh, through the 90s, maybe even into the early 2000s, the Reverend Jim Forbes. Compassion. What does it look like? Come with me to 915 South Bloodworth Street in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I grew up. If you come in, you will see us evening time at table, set for 10, but not always all seats filled. At the point when dinner is ready to be served, since mom had eight kids, Sometimes she said she couldn't tell who was who and where they were. Before we could eat, she would ask, are all the children in? And if someone happened to be missing, we would have to, we say, fix a plate for that person, put it in the oven, then we could say grace and we could eat. There we go. Just that short one minute giving us a sense of what compassion 
can look like, or all the children in. So anyway, back to Diogenes. Oh, there we go. Back to Diogenes and his lamp. Like I said, I, with Paul's question, is there any compassion, I see myself kind of like Diogenes, walking around with a lamp, looking in people's faces. Is there any compassion? I can imagine myself, and maybe you can imagine yourself too, walking amidst conversations about gun rights or voting rights these days sitting in at a school board meeting when there are discussions about certain books that may or may not be appropriate for the classroom, or discussions about diversity, equity, and inclusion curricula. I can imagine myself in places like that. You can hear the voices raised, and I can imagine myself asking, is there any compassion? I can imagine myself, and maybe you can imagine yourself too, walking among the halls of decision-making, maybe at the national level, maybe here in Lansing, maybe at the local level, and overhearing the debates about immigration reform, about abortion rights, about the problem of homelessness, and asking, Where is compassion? No matter which side of the issue one takes, what side of the issue one takes here, defensiveness and self-righteousness too often drown out compassion. And before we know it, we lose sight of what compassion even looks like. We can search it out on the internet. I suppose that's kind of the 21st century of Diogenes and his lantern looking for compassion. We search the internet. Sometimes we call it doom scrolling on Facebook. Reading the doom stories but looking for uplifting video clips. My mom gets them in her email from friends of hers in the retirement community she lives in. Uplifting messages and videos. They're all over Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. These little video clips will provide us of scenes of people rescuing animals in floods. Scenes of people caring for neglected children or giving free haircuts to people who live on the streets. (coughs) These video clips will stir in us feelings of sympathy and pity. They may even move us to acts of charity, but this is not compassion. Compassion is not just a feeling we get. It's not just a warm, fuzzy feeling that we get when we witness something nice or do something nice ourselves. Compassion seeks physicality. Compassion is only realized. It is only recognized when it is embodied. Just think about the word for a moment. Come passion. Come passion. C-O-M, come, the prefix means with. Passion is from the Latin word passio, which means to suffer. Hence, our common use of the word today, to suffer with. To be alongside with someone in their suffering. To be present with them in their suffering. Not simply to fix them, but to be with them. Someone told me one time that kind of the motto of Stephen's ministers is, don't just do something, sit there. Come, passion, being with, being with. 
I believe we can also extend the meaning of compassion to, the, to be present with people in what they are passionate about, right? Because passions are also things that we have strong feelings and convictions about. So I believe compassion can also mean to be with someone in their convictions. Both of these meanings, after all, really, are what we are called to do and to be as disciples of Jesus. He is the one who shows us how to be present with people in their suffering and in their exclusion and in their marginalization. He is the one who calls us to be with him, to stand with him in his convictions, in what he is passionate about, in his passion for justice, and for tearing down the walls of privilege and exclusion. As disciples, we are called to become passionate in the way of Jesus. But the best way, and probably really much more my favorite word to demonstrate that compassion must be embodied is with the Greek word. That is kind of weird and fun to say. The Greek word is splachna. Splachna. <laughs> in English, it gets spelled S P L A G. C-H-N-A, splajna. I'm not sure if that's a chi or a cha, but splajna. This is the words that's used here in Philippians for compassion. And it gets used over and over and over again throughout the Gospels. Every time one of the Gospel writers wants to talk to us about how Jesus is moved to compassion. Splajna. It is a word that refers to our soft internal organs, the viscera, from which we get the word visceral. Our soft internal organs, particularly those in our abdomen, our gut, more literally, our bowels. Compassion is what Jesus felt in his gut, in the very depth of his being. Compassion comes from the gut. We feel it in our bodies. It is not just something we talk about. It's not just something we reflect on and theorize or watch from afar or experience virtually through the net. Compassion literally comes from the depth of our being and therefore must be acted upon. Have you ever tried to hold back the urge to vomit? It can't be done because your gut is compelled to act. And if we are going to follow the example of Jesus, we must feel our compassion from the depth of our being. This, my friends, is why we celebrate Pride Month. Because we must embody our compassion. We can't just write about it in a statement, put it on our church sign, or write it on our bylaws. We must embody the conviction that we have written in our bylaws to affirm the dignity and worth of every person as having been created in the image of God. To honor the principle that discrimination is incompatible with Christ's gospel of unconditional love. As a compassionate congregation, we embody our conviction by standing alongside, 
by being present with, by suffering with, by crying with those whose lives and whose loves have been called an abomination, have been called insanity, or incompatible with Christian teaching. And my apologies to those of you for whom those words cut like a knife. Words like these are spewed not just by politicians. Far more tragically, they are spewed by churches. They are spewed by ministers and they are spewed by members of their congregation. And they have been for generations. Compassion. Is there any compassion? Further along in that talk given by Jim Forbes, that little bit that you saw, he sums up what he learned about compassion in his childhood home. I came to think that Mama Eternal, Mama Eternal is always wondering, are all the children in? And if we have been faithful in caring and sharing, we had the sense that justice and peace would have a chance in this world. What are we learning about compassion in this house, in our house? What are we teaching about compassion in our house? How are we imagining compassion? Remember what God does with imagination? Beloved, let us listen for the voice of Mama Eternal asking us, are all the children in? Let us ensure that all God's children will know compassion in and in through us so that justice and peace will have a chance in this world.